Welcome back to Geek Channel 8. I'm Eric. And I'm Johanna. Today on the show, the 1979 James Bond film, Moonraker. So, you think you know your commercials. How about some of these? Shampoo for that lovely outdoor girl look. <laughs> Just could be dog food. Those wonderful watches that keep the astronauts on the job. Oops. Uh, sorry. And what about those airline promises? Well, stand by for a few surprises. They may promise you the moon. We deliver. More thrills, more spills. And guess who's dropped in for a bite? Jaws is back. Mr. Bond, you defy all my attempts to plan an amusing death for you. Venice captures the romantic mood. Overpowering your scent. Holly was a warm girl with the right connections, like the CIA. Could this possibly be the moment for us to pool our resources? We would be better off working together. This bond is out of this world. Don't miss the liftoff. just finished listening to Werner Herzog's latest book, The Twilight World. Listen to it on audio tape. Reading, of course, is always best. But if you're an audiobook person, Herzog reads it himself, and his voice is incredible. And the way he reenacts some of the scenes of dialogue in the film makes it especially wonderful. But what the book is about is Hiro Onada, a Japanese soldier who defended a small island in the Philippines for 29 years after World War II. His mission was to guard this island and prevent the United States from taking over because it was in a strategic location that if the U.S. had occupied the island and used it as an air base, they would have been able to launch very successful attacks from there. So he had to make sure that the U.S. never established a presence. However... He was also given some instructions saying, don't listen to anybody other than me, your commanding officer, no matter what they tell you, because they're going to try to trick you into thinking you can let down your guard, but you mustn't listen to them. You must continue to defend the island. So given these special instructions he'd received, all evidence that suggested the war had ended, he refused to believe for 29 years living out in the jungle, continuing to attack, you know, some of the Filipino people who were living there. You know, he would bomb their airfields. And when people would come into the jungle to try to tell him, like, hey, buddy, stand down, he wouldn't listen because he thought it was all a trap. And then eventually this graduate student comes and finds him in the jungle and manages to persuade him 29 years after the fact that the war had in fact ended. And the way Herzog recreates these scenes based on interviews with people involved, and Herzog eventually gets to meet Onada at the end of the story, it's really compelling. It's a short book, so it's a it's a fun, quick read, but it's you know got everything that you would want in a Werner Herzog story. So highly recommend it. The Twilight world. The Twilight World. That's interesting. I'm not going to go into it again because I talked about it on the last podcast, but I have been listening to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History interminably long 
um, coverage of the Pacific Theater in World War II called Supernova in the East. And Supernova in the East starts with Onada's story. Oh, nice. how eventually he got this medal and I guess the emperor came. I I think the emperor came to the island to uh, award him the medal because he wouldn't trust anybody else, you know? Yeah, the emperor and his original commanding officer who you know, could barely walk <laughs> kind so, of thing. So I hadn't actually listened to that. That's how the story starts off. And uh, Dan Carlin will probably get back to that part. But because, you know, I listened to the first few parts of this when they came out, I think he started making this before the pandemic. It just took forever for them to get all these episodes done. Plus Carlin wrote a book somewhere in there. So that probably derailed things for a while. And they take a long time to produce these things. They're like movies that they've never gotten to the end of Anata's story. So they'll probably they'll circle back at the end of this series of podcasts. But he's a man who needs no plug. He's been podcasting since the beginning of podcasting almost. But if you're not familiar with Dan Carlin, it's a hardcore history. He is not a historian. He makes no bones about the fact that he's a fan of history. He does quote a lot of original sources and secondary sources and stuff like that. So he's better than me at that. But much like I say on this podcast, we are not scholars on this. We are film fans. That's why we tell you not to write in and correct our pronunciation because we don't care. But yeah, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Check it out. And hopefully maybe someday he'll plug our show. That would be awesome. Yeah, let's jump into this movie, 1979's Moonraker. Now, I've told this story before. I'm going to tell it again. When I was nine years old, I was already way into science fiction stuff. My sister being younger than me, one time we went to the multiplex, whole family, and I guess my parents decided to go to their movie. And I think this was somewhat subtly done before we even got there, like they had this secret plan. They went to see Moonraker. We went to see a a repeat showing of 101 Dalmatians. Oh. Which even for me as a kid, by the time I was nine, it was a little bit young for me, but I think it was more like, well, somebody has to watch your sister, you know? So I ended up going to it and I wasn't totally opposed to it. I'm a Disney fan. I was still, I liked Disney when I was nine. I still like Disney now. And so I went to it, but I didn't know they were going to this Moonraker thing. And I didn't know a lot about James Bond, but I did know that I liked sci-fi. And so when I found out what they were in, obviously our movie got out way before theirs did. Uh, The running time of these Disney films is much shorter than a Bond film, probably an hour and a half or less compared to Moonraker's two hours. And so we were sitting in the lobby and they're like, where are your parents? And they're like, oh, they're in Moonraker. And eventually it got to the point where the usher went in after we had been there for a while and they didn't want to be in charge of us. So they went in and checked with our parents if we could come in to the, it, which I think it was PG or something. I don't know. Uh, I forget what the rating of this was, but... Um, well, I think at the, there was no PG-13 at the time. There was so no PG-13. It must have been PG. So... Uh, They wanted to make sure that it was okay with our parents. Our parents finally said yes. By this time, it was the end of the movie. So they they let us in right in time for the the last scene, which was probably the most adult of the scenes in it. But it was in zero G. And I was a space fan. I'm like, why didn't you let me see this? You know, and I insisted. My sister fell asleep. My or my mom and my sister went home. I forget. But my dad let me stay there. And this is in the days when they didn't care if you stayed for another showing of a film once you bought a ticket. So nowadays you can't go to multiple showings. You have to buy multiple tickets. But back then you could just buy one ticket and you could sit through that movie however many times you wanted, you know. So that's how I saw Moonraker, my first Bond film in the theater. So to this day, when I think of Bond, I think of these people. This is the Bond that I think of, uh, Roger Moore. This is the Q that I think of. This is the money penny that I think of. This is the M that I think of when I think of Bond. 
Now, other people have come along and done really well. Dame Judy Dench is M in particular. But I will always think of this money penny. I will always think of this Q as the definitive money penny and Q bond. It's not my favorite bond, but it is the first bond that comes to mind when I think of bond. Well, I am jealous that you got to see this in the theater, even if you were nine and couldn't appreciate all all of the aspects of the film. But I was not born yet. <laughs> so, But I saw this when I was about the same age. My dad introduced me to Bond pretty early. I was, you know, six or seven years old. And this is one of the ones that I remember liking the most as a kid because it is one of the most kid-friendly Bonds. And because I, like you, was a huge Star Wars fan. And that is exactly what they were banking on when they made Moonraker, that Star Wars being such a huge success in 1977, this was not their original plan for the next Bond film to make, but they saw big dollar signs, so they pivoted and made Moonraker the next Bond following following Star Wars. When we were talking about Live and Let Die, I said this is one of the great things about the Bond franchise is it will follow the trends in action movies at the time. And at this time, it happened to be science fiction. You know, at the time of Live and Let Die, it was black exploitation. At this time, it's science fiction, so they're like, Green light, Moonraker. We're making that one. As it happens, this is one of the last Bond films that was based on a book written by Fleming. The next one wouldn't be until Casino Royale in 2006. Um, I say based on a book, but we'll get into that later, whether I should well, even say so. I recently read the novel, and if you polled Ian Fleming fans about the best Bond novel, many, many would list Moonraker as their top choice. If you polled Bond movie fans about the worst Bond film, <laughs> many would choose Moonraker. Not all. There are cases to be made for several other Bond films, and there are cases to be made for several other novels. So this is, I'm just going to say, widely considered to be one of the best Bond books and one of the worst Bond movies. I disagree with both of those. I struggled with Moonraker for a while. Maybe it's that kid nostalgia of it being my first Bond film. And there are some parts of it that even at nine years old, I was like, oh, that's, that's too much. That's just too slapsticky. We'll get into that part when we get to it. But the book starts out with M calling Bond into his office. M wants to know if Bond will work off the clock for him on a private mission. Hmm. He is a member of one of these gentlemen's clubs. Blades is the name of the club in London, uh, where they play bridge. And there is a line thrown out at some point where M says that he plays bridge with Drax. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting little detail. Well, Drax is a little bit different looking in the book. He's described as having red hair. I'll read, a, read you guys the description of Drax in a second here. M wants him to come to this club with him because he knows that Bond has been trained for the Casino Royale mission in cards and cheating and stuff like that. And everyone at the club, they know that Drax is cheating, but they are worried about calling him out on it because they don't want there to be a scandal. <laughs> you know, this is very British. Yeah. But he is a hero. Drax is a hero to these people. There's kind of a cautionary tale in here that Fleming's trying to work in here where – Imagine, if you will, that the conquest of space is strategically important. Okay, so this is before the space race, mind you. Yeah, I was going to say Fleming's novel, it's like 1954, 1955 or something yeah. when he wrote this. And at that point, the Soviet Union hadn't even launched Sputnik yet. 
nothing was happening. There was, you know, like a Soviet youth magazine in 1951 that referenced space travel. And that's like the biggest headline that had been in the space race yet. Yeah. In the novel itself, it talks about how they haven't achieved escape velocity yet. That is a goal. But rocketry was more about missiles. missiles. Yeah. And in this sci-fi novel, because it really is science fiction for its time. It soon became not science fiction anymore. But at this time, it was science fiction. A lot of the uh, German rocket scientists, they were snapped up by either the Soviet Union or the U.S. Imagine a time where instead of that happening, they were snatched up by either the Soviets or the British. (laughs) Now, we talked about when we're doing the quater mass episodes where we talked about the British rocketry group. We talked about how Britain never really had this rocket program, but it kind of always wanted one, it seemed like. Well, (laughs) there's this hero. He had been in World War II. He suffers from amnesia or something like that, from being caught in an explosion and half his face gone, but he's like made this fortune in metallurgy and metals, and he is a millionaire. Now, a millionaire, a multimillionaire in the early to mid-50s, that would be a billionaire by today's standards. Well, and he does come off as kind of an Elon Musk character. That's where I was going with this. (laughs) So there is a kind of cautionary tale here about uh, private industry type getting all this money. And rather than the government, like NASA, being in charge of the space program, a billionaire. Imagine a world where a billion billionaires are the ones that are going to space and like not everybody else, you know? I like, would love to see them reboot this film. Like if they continue to reboot old bonds, like this this is yeah, I would love I would love that. Let me read a description of Drax from the novel and tell me if he reminds you of anyone you know. So they're debating why he should cheat at cards. And by the way, like a full third of the novel deals with this card cheating at this club in London. And this is why it's so hard to get started versus Live and Let Die, which I had read right before it, the book right before it, where he's already in Harlem by that point in and maybe even on his way to Florida by that point in the in Live and Let Die. I, I had a hard time getting into this, but if you do decide to read it, Try to find a print version because I read a digital version initially and Bond's hand is actually demonstrated (laughs) using hearts and diamonds and stuff like that. And it makes much more sense. I read it and then the next day I picked up the book version and I was like, oh, now I know exactly how Bond won. Bond himself cheats too. Because there's Um, a bridge puzzle in the middle of the book. In the book. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, so I'm reading from this old novel that I picked up. This is either my dad's copy or a copy that I got at a garage sale. So this is – whatever the case is, this printing of this paperback is like older than me. (laughs) This is the 12th printing, July 1964. Here's what he says. So this is Bond trying to figure out – and we're a full 58 pages into this. All right. So this is – the whole novel's only 175 pages long and this is 50 (laughs) – page 58 – So this is why I disagree with this being the best Bond novel. But – and the more he thought about it, the stranger it all seemed. Why should Drax, a millionaire – insert billionaire – a public hero, a man with a unique position in the country – remember red hair here – why should this remarkable man cheat at cards? What could he achieve by it? What could he prove to himself? Did he think he was so much a law unto himself, so far above the common herd and their puny canons of behavior that he could spit in the face of public opinion? Bond's mind paused. Spit in their faces. That just about described his manner at Blades. The combination of superiority and scorn, as if he was dealing with human muck so far beneath contempt that there was no need to put up even a pretense of decent behavior in its company. Presumably, Drax enjoyed gambling. Perhaps it eased the tensions in him, the tensions that showed in his harsh voice, his nail-biting, his constant sweating, but he mustn't lose. It would be contemptible to lose to these inferior people, so at whatever risk he must cheat his way to victory. As for the possibility of detection, presumably he thought that he could bluster his way out of any corner. 
if he thought about it at all. And people with obsessions reflected Bond were blind to danger. And then he goes into uh, different types of, of people like kleptomaniacs and pyromaniacs and stuff like that. But what obsession was it that was consuming this man? What was the origin of the compulsive urge that was driving him down the steep hill into the sea? All the signs pointed to paranoia, delusions of grandeur, and behind that, of persecution. The contempt in his face, the bullying voice, the expression of secret triumph with which he had met defeat after a moment of bitter collapse, the triumph of the maniac who knows that whatever the facts may say, he is right. Whoever may try to thwart him, he can overcome. For him, there is no defeat because of his secret power. He knows how to make gold. He can fly like a bird. He is almighty. The man in the padded cell who is God. Does this sound like anyone you know? Yeah, well, uh, it sounds a lot like Donald Trump. Does it not sound like he was writing about Donald Trump way That's back then? Frightening. That's really frightening. Um, yeah, talk about science fiction being real. <laughs> okay, sorry to go on a long quoting from the novel there, but I thought it was worth pointing out because this would make an excellent movie to reboot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and having someone who's a combination of that type of person as described and like an Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, private millionaire going to space type person. Although, did I read correctly? Don't they find out at some point that Drax is actually like a Nazi? He's a Nazi. Yeah. Which He's, is an interesting Bond. Th like and, We don't see Nazis in the Bond world. Well, not a neo-Nazi. He's an actual Nazi. Because remember, this was written only four or five years after the war, right? <laughs> so it's a lot more believable that there could be this Nazi conspiracy. So in Moonraker, Drax is actually a Nazi. He and his unit had planned to blow up this allied base, and he accidentally gets caught in the explosion, loses his memory. He was in disguise to plant this bomb in a British uniform, so they assume that he is British. He was raised before the war in British schools, so he speaks perfect English. Nobody doubts that he's English. He doesn't actually have amnesia, but he fakes it, and he slowly accumulates power in Britain. He becomes this multimillionaire, and then he recruits all these Germans, and they create this Moonraker, which is a rocket, and the original plan in the original novel is they're going to nuke London. But what's crazy about it is everybody's behind him. The BBC, the press, everybody loves him. He's this hero. He's saving Britain because Britain doesn't have nukes and Soviets do. And so there's this test firing that's going to happen. That it's going to not have a warhead in on it and be in the English Channel. But it's actually going to have a warhead and go for London. And... The uh, heroine is named Gala Brand, and she is working for, to make things less complicated, well, let's just say Scotland Yard, okay? <laughs> She's essentially working for MI5. I don't want to get into the fine gradations of what MI5 does and what uh, Scotland Yard does and whether they're the same or different. There's some overlap there, but basically she is an MI5 agent. And then another agent is killed. So MI5 has their person in there, and that's Gayla Brand. And another department has a person in there, and that person is killed because Drax's people find out that he's a spy. And so in order to replace them, that department asks M if they know anyone. They're like, we need someone that speaks German. We need someone that is familiar with the Russians. And they're like, I got the guy for you, you know, and they send Bond. Honestly, another reason why I, this is not my favorite Bond novel is Bond, he does, he's not the one that so, figures out what's going on. Gala actually more or less is the, the one that, that figures out what's going on. And more often of the time, she's the one that makes all the breaks in it, you know, in the case. Bond is still there to do the action, but she sort of solves everything. And what's really interesting for a Bond novel is that, you know, they go through all this same death trap type stuff where they're going to be caught in the exhaust of the rocket taking off and they hide in, a, in an air vent and all of that jazz. But 
there's scenes where they have to huddle together. Their clothes are scorched off. There's another part where they're like in the shower together. She, he saves her life. She kisses him or something like that. You think they're going to end up sleeping together. Again, Bond does not sleep with her. What happens at the end is he meets her in the park after it's all over. And even M says, you two go off on a holiday together, whatever. She meets him in the park with her fiance. She laughed. I'm sorry, I can't oblige, but there are plenty of others willing to be picked. It's a reference that they talk about roses being picked. Yes, I suppose so, said Bond. Well, goodbye, Gala. He held out his hand. Goodbye, James. He touched her for the last time, and then they turned away from each other and walked off into their different lives. And that's it, which is uh, really different for Bond, too. But kind of a cool ending. I mean, I actually liked that a lot. It it was kind of cool. Anyway, very different. And it had to be very different because the idea of surviving Nazis, there were pretty aged already. By 1979. Even by 1979, you know, which. Let's check this against Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like, yeah. <laughs> it would have been a little too much to combine space and Nazis and not be ripping off Steven Spielberg. <laughs> but the Drax in the film does have some Nazi-like characteristics. Yeah. Well, it's funny. They almost got Spielberg to direct the film. Spielberg actually offered to direct Moonraker. Would have been fun to see Spielberg and George Lucas together well, Lucas- <laughs> on this project. Spielberg was excited about doing a Bond film, and Lucas said to him, forget Bond. I got something better for you. And <laughs> yeah. that was yeah. – that in, would end up being – Indiana Ra- Jones. Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it it worked out, I think, although you know some of the direction maybe could have benefited from, from an expert hand. But I'm going to go into some of the more details of the behind the scenes as we explore the film. But the one thing I wanted to note – you probably guessed that the budget for this film was a lot bigger than previous Bond, given the sizes of the sets that they had to produce and the special effects involved. Moonraker cost $34 million to make. Let's just remember, Live and Let Die was like seven, and Spy Who Loved Me, which was the film immediately before Moonraker from 1977, was half of Moonraker's budget. They took a big leap. (laughs) Yeah, but we have to mention one mitigating factor there, which is that there was rampant inflation in the 1970s. Well, and because of that, they actually ended up making this film a co-production with France. And I didn't know this was a thing, but in the 70s, there was a lot of interest in the European film industry and the British film industry having a little bit more cross-pollination. So as part of this Anglo- France film treaty. This film was one of the films during that time that fell under this treaty. So like a good portion of the film is was made in France, which explains why Drax's estate looks like a little baby Versailles. It was a chateau in France. Yeah. <laughs> which they pretended had been airlifted to California or something. But that was definitely filmed in France. <laughs> So Yeah, and I don't know how you'd say his name. Michael Lonsdale was yeah. himself a French actor. Well, and they had originally were going to cast James Mason as Drax. That was their plan. But then they had to cast a French actor as part of the conditions of this agreement. And um, I would say he was one of the, the highlights of this film. Yeah, I thought he was great. And James Mason would have eaten the scenery all over the place. I thought actually... The casting of Drax, like, he was not too over the top, kind of perfect at this. But they managed to keep the film affordable by partnering with France on it because it was so expensive to film in Britain at the time. And actually, 55% of the film is owned by the French studio they worked with. Only 45% of the film is owned by Broccoli. Not very much of the film was made at Pinewood Studios, really just the interior of the cable cars, those scenes, which I assume had a blue or green screen behind it for the mountains, and the space battle exteriors were filmed at the soundstage at Pinewood. And that's pretty much it. And then the rest of it was filmed like, you know, there are scenes in London and like, you know, recognizable cities like Venice where it had to be filmed there. But pretty much everything else is filmed in France. Uh, Speaking of the sets, when it comes to set decor, We're not at the 80s yet, but the 80s look is starting to come in. 
So now gone are those horrible greens and browns and simulated wood paneling. And now we get the high tech 80s. Even that t broccoli title sequence is in reds and blues, you know, colors I really associate more with the 80s than the, the 70s. And you get a lot of white furniture and a lot of black and white, but yes, you do have the beige in the clothes <laughs> starting to come in too. Yeah, we um, if we want to revive our uh, Ask a 14-year-old segment, my son watched Moonraker with me because it was my birthday last week and I decided this is what I wanted to do. I wanted everyone to sit and watch Moonraker with me like the way I did when I was a child. <laughs> And my son couldn't believe the intro sequences because he's more used to the newer Bonds where, you know, there are silhouettes of naked women, but it's not anything like what it is here, nor the fembot-like entourage of lady astronauts <laughs> that Finn, Finn was just beside himself. Like, what is this? <laughs> so he enjoyed that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The film ended up grossing about $210 million, making it United Artists' highest grossing film at the time. So well worth it, even if it didn't have the critical success of previous Bond. I want to give this movie, you know, people diss it a lot, but there's some things I want to really give it credit for. And one is this thing opens with the space shuttle hijacking. And this space shuttle, they did their homework. Because this space shuttle being ferried by plane is something that actually would later happen with the space shuttle. They have a freaking space shuttle, and it looks just like the space shuttle. And it takes off with the booster rockets, with the three rockets, you know, and stuff like that. This, Des Despite the fact that it predates NASA's space shuttle program. By years. <laughs> by years. So this came out in 1979, which means they started work on it at least in 1978, maybe even earlier, the first shuttle launch wasn't until 1981. So they did their homework on this whole space shuttle thing. Well, some of their homework was hiring NASA as actual consultants on the film. Okay. Like NASA, well, okay. NASA did review the scripts. I don't know how involved they were in the special effects, but they did have actual rocket scientists on board. Still mm. impressive I mean, maybe NASA got their ideas from Moonraker and not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty soon after that, Bond is hired by M to investigate. And while en route, he is attacked and we get to bring back one of our favorite villain henchmen. Shark uh, meter. <laughs> <laughs> Jaws. We get Jaws back in this film. Apparently a huge hit after his previous appearance. So there's a an amazing skydiving scene. We should say that Jaws was in The Spy Who Loved Me. Yes. Which, previous to this. And playing a much more serious villain in Spy Who Loved Me. Here he is almost a caricature of that character. <laughs> Starting with showing up in the middle of this hijacking bond on the plane. He thinks he's, you know, en route on his mission. And then it turns out everyone else on the plane is evil. And they're going to take their parachutes and leave Bond to go down with the damaged plane. But Bond jumps out of the plane. No parachute. He's like, nah. <laughs> well, he gets pushed out. Yes, by Jaws. Then he goes for the other guy's parachute struggle and get the parachute away from the other guy. Well, and I wasn't thinking about this while I was watching it. You know, I was too busy thinking like, oh, I wonder how they did the shots where it's clearly Roger Moore, like, you know, on the sound stage. But there are a number of sequences where there are characters who seem to not have parachutes. And obviously, like, they wouldn't have let them not have parachutes. So how did they make it look like that? But they built apparently special parachutes that were underneath their clothes and would erupt out and they designed them in a special way so that the camera people who were also skydiving right next to them wouldn't get hit with the parachute when it went off. A lot of effort went into making this scene. They had to do like 90 different jumps in order to get all the shots they needed. Yeah. Just unbelievable. So, yeah. So basically he ends up getting the parachute. The other guy dies. 
Jaws also gets into a fight with Bond in midair, but eventually they separate. Jaws plunges to what would be his death, except for his fall is broken first by a circus tent and then by the high wire axe net below the circus tent. So he manages to survive. Bond, meanwhile, goes to Drax Industries. Yep, in California, which California is portrayed in this film as a land of, like, gorgeous babes. Just, <laughs> just like, sunshine, technology, and gorgeous women is what they seem to think California is. Well, and this predates Silicon Valley's rise in the 80s. Technology is more along the lines of um, West Coast technology. Think of like really the Pacific Northwest, like Boeing and stuff like that, which I know is not in California. I'm just using it as an example. But there are all these super fit men and women doing exercises and preparing for space flight. We meet Drax and it's tea time. And this is kind of interesting considering that the actor is a French actor, so maybe it doesn't seem like the affectations of an American billionaire who's attracted to European culture and has high tea and also hunts pheasants or whatever and, like, lives in this fake French chateau in California. Of course, I mean, it's a real one. But (laughs) Bond shows up at high tea, and we meet Drax and his dogs, and... These Dobermans, Dobermans, these yeah. Dobermans are there. Drax throws steak and the Dobermans just like don't touch it. They just sit there. And it's such a wonderful character detail. They sit there and wait. And every once in a while we cut to the dogs still sitting there and waiting. And eventually Drax like snaps his fingers. Yeah, and- they have this whole conversation. And then at the end of the conversation, Drax sna- finally snaps his fingers and the dogs wolf down the steak. Yeah, it's a great way to introduce both the concept of the dogs, which will come back later, and also Drax's power and control and kind of like fastidiousness all in one scene. Drax gives his henchman Chang some instructions to make sure that some accident befalls Bond, that he meets some harm. (laughs) Yeah, and then he meets this woman astronaut, Dr. Holly Goodhead. Yep, classic... (laughs) Classic Bond name for a lady. (laughs) And she takes him to this gravity simulator, G simulator, which is like a centrifuge thing. And she talks him into trying it out and says, don't worry about it. If you chicken out, you can press this little red button and it'll stop. You know, even a 70-year-old can take three three Gs, you know. Most people pass out at seven and Bond takes like 12 by the time Chang sabotages it and speeds Chang it up. Chang sneaks in and speeds it up, and he nearly dies, although he has this gadget that Q gave him, which is a dart gun that is triggered by wrist movement, his main gadget in this film, and it's got nerve darts, and it also has armor-piercing darts. He shoots one of these armor-piercing darts at the controls. And, and fortunately, the result is that the machine stops instead of, like, Keeps going, but I guess he had nothing to lose at that point. Yeah. She shows back up and says she has no idea what went wrong. But Bond was able to take some photographs while he was prowling about the place. With the help of Corinne Dufour, another of the French actresses required to be in the film in order to fulfill the contract (laughs) treaty thing, whatever. And she's the sexy pilot that, of course, brought bond into this establishment and I guess she took a liking to him because she's willing to help him out much to her peril so this was one of the things that Finn pointed out as like a this is hysterical that this is even in there but in the scene where Bond seduces Corinne Dufour um, before then doing his classic move of like seduces a lady and then gets her to give him information um, she says something about like you know, my mother made this list of things that I shouldn't do on a first date. And Bond is, you know, like, oh, really? And then there's some flirting back and forth. And then at some point, Bond says, like, well, whatever happened to that list that your mother made? And she <laughs> says, I never learned to read. In this, like, sexy voice, like it's an accomplishment or, you know, a turn on or something. And Finn was like, what is this? (laughs) Like, how has I never learned to read a come on? (laughs) 
anyway, sorry, I had to include that because it was it was just like one of those lines in this film that sticks out as like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. When he takes these photos, he discovers that there's some sort of glass vials that are being manufactured by one of Drax Industries subsidiaries in Venice. And there's our clue. Now to our next location. But not before Drax has Corinne killed by his pet dogs. Yeah. In a dramatic slow-mo chase scene through the forest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a whole bit where he was out hunting with the dogs. And when the hunt's over, they sound this horn. And it's the... Uh, the it's, spot spoke so it's Zarth- Zarthustra from 2001. Yeah. So yeah. it's one of a few callbacks to other science fiction films. And we should mention that Drax makes his second attempt on Bond's life during this pheasant hunting scene that he's got an assassin in the treetops and... He convinces Bond to take one of the guns, the shotguns or whatever. Hoping to distract him from the fact that there's an assassin there, but... uh, Bond shoots toward the trees. Drax says, you missed. And this guy falls out of the trees. And he's... I think... I'm not sure what Bond's comeback was. Something like, did I? You know? And like... (laughs) Anyway, he travels to Venice... Venetian glass is, you know, world-renowned, and so we get a tour of a glass-blowing facility and see uh, various stuff there. But he follows someone to a backroom area where they uh, punch into a keypad the infamous five tones yeah. from Close Encounters. Yes. So hopefully Spielberg was happy about that. He didn't direct this Bond film, but there was a reference to one of his movies anyway. In here, he discovers that they are manufacturing nerve gas to be put in these hexagonal vials. There's an accident and it, you know, he observes the nerve gas killing the workers in this factory, but not, uh, I don't know if he notices or not, but we as the audience notice that the mice in a cage here do not die, only the humans. There are some really great fight scenes and things that happen in Venice. There's sort of a chitty chitty bang bang moment when the gondola boat turns into a car. Da, and... This is well, this is a bridge too far for me. This is this is one of the worst. This is why people hate Moonraker, and I get it. It made me squirm in my seat when I saw it. It gets way too slapsticky. Bond has some kind of gondola. That turns, he wears the hat. He wears the gondolier's hat. I mean, it gets it, very silly. <laughs> it gets super silly, and he drives it up on land, and it's just— it's. However, the fight scene in the glass museum, awesome. Like, there is something very satisfying about watching expensive glass things get broken. Yeah. Drax's other henchman, other than Jaws, that we didn't mention is Chang, and Chang knows kendo, and so he has a kendo sword. Just so happens that there's a— glass sword in this glass blowing place and uh, Bond uses that. They fight. It's a great fight because a lot of glass gets broken. Shall we, we talk about fight scenes. Do we want to talk about the Skyway? They end up in Rio. Yeah. And, and Jaws is on their trail. There's a great line when Bond meets his next Bond girl and uh, he says, how do you kill five hours in Rio if you don't samba? And they find ways to do that, but then they also go out in the streets and there's like a big festival happening and lots Carnival. Of, yeah. Carnival. Yeah. yeah. And um and they run into Jaws again there. Jaws in like a really creepy clown outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they they manage to get away. The crowd sort of helps them escape, but they run into Jaws very quickly again on this cable car where Jaws breaks one of the cables with his amazing teeth. If you have comments on the cable car, go for it. But there's a moment right after that we have to go, talk about. Go to the moment after it. Okay. So I'm curious. I, I want our writers to, to write in to us and let us know if you remember whether the girl that Jaws meets after the cable car scene has braces or not. This is a this is a classic Mandela thing. Exactly. And I was watching it this time and I, you know, there was this scene coming up and, you know, she's flirting with Jaws and my husband says, "What is going on here?" I'm like, "Oh, just wait. Just wait a second. It's all going to be explained why they're attracted to each other." And then she smiles at him and she didn't have braces and I was I like, didn't, I you sh- fell for the Mandela I was I knew that I knew about the Mandela effect with this thing so I knew that she didn't and I knew that it was a thing that everybody misremembers I didn't remember that this was one of those Mandela effect things and so when she smiled and didn't have the braces I was just I was like 
wait, wait a minute. <laughs> and I had to do all sorts of research. There are fan theories out there. And I thought I remembered that too, but I had heard since the last time I watched Moonraker, I read about the Mandela effect, you know, and this particular thing being one of them. And I was like, wait, I thought that was, I thought she had braces too. So I knew that was coming up and I knew that she didn't, but I knew that at one point in the past, I had believed that also. Yes. And so for those of you who who don't know about the Mandela effect, it refers to something um, in like the 80s when everyone was convinced that Nelson Mandela had died in prison and it hadn't happened. Like he yeah. didn't die until 2003. And but everyone like insisted they remembered in the news that Mandela had died. Yeah, this was common. I think I even I had that false memory. Yeah. Anyway, so this is another one of those things where there is this collective false memory of this uh, female love interest of Jaws having braces and she doesn't. Anyway, please let us know your thoughts. Maybe you remember that there's a secret, you know, TBS Superstation broadcast of Bond where she had braces and and that it's just been corrected out of the record, but but let us know. Anyway, moving okay. moving on to our next set piece. <laughs> well, let's get to space. They stow away aboard one of the Moonrakers. There are five or six of them, and they're being sent up to what we find out is a base in space. When they get there, this is when we find out Drax's full plan. He is going to launch these globes filled with nerve gas that it can kill 100,000 people. And there's and only people. And only people. Specifically not- just humans. Basically, he's like a Nazi, and he's going to like have his superior race, these astronauts that have been all handpicked for being perfect, and uh, he's going to start this new master race uh, world. This is when <laughs> Jaws and his love Dolly. interest here, Dolly, <laughs> realize that that doesn't include them, and so they switch sides, and there's a fight aboard this space station there is a jamming or cloaking device over this whole space station so none of the nations of the world can actually detect it. And Dr. Goodhead and Bond sabotage that, and then suddenly everybody sees it. Now, I wanted to call attention to this scene because there's a scene where the Americans and the Russians are talking on the phone, and the Russians say they're going to blow this thing up. They think the Americans are behind it. The guy they talk to is General Gogol, who is another recurring character we're going to see throughout the Bond films. He was also in The Spy Who Loved Me before this. He's going to be in, for your eyes only, Octopussy and The Living Daylights. He becomes a kind of important other character in the Bond universe. I didn't realize those were all the same guy. That's really cool. Yeah. We won't spoil the ending for you here, but basically... Can we say there are lasers? There are lasers. There are lasers. (laughs) There are. There's a big... There is a big fight involving lasers. Yeah, no, we're not going to ruin the epic ballet that is this ending sequence by trying to describe it. (laughs) These sequences are amazing, and they are really the redeeming factor in Moonraker, in my opinion, is these all these zero-G scenes in Moonraker are amazing. Yeah, and there's a very satisfying death for Drax that involves an airlock. What's not to love? You know, now we've got it all tied up. It is officially a sci-fi film. (laughs) Yeah, it is a sci-fi film. And then at the very end, there is Bond. And uh, Dr. Dr. Goodhead. Holly Goodhead. Is it Holly? I think it's Holly. Yes. Goodhead. Making love in zero G, covered with only a sheet. And this is where this was the first time I ever saw James Bond was that scene. (laughs) Walked right in. Walked right in. And the whole world is about to view this because he's a hero and they finally establish a connection and a video link to the the shuttle and this is what they see. I think that wraps it up. Is there anything else you wanted to... Not anything in detail. Just just want to mention, you know, this film is so full of fun silliness and as long as you go in knowing that it's quite enjoyable 
there's a scene where like Jaws takes a boat over Iguazu, like goes over the falls and survives. Like, oh, there's a whole nother powerboat chase in this. This one has one too. <laughs> well, and we weren't going to set off the shark meter for the boa constrictor, but there's a fight with a boa constrictor underwater. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just. To, just about everything, including a little bit of the theme from Magnificent Seven playing in a brief sequence where James Bond seems to be dressed up as the man with no name, um, riding it on a horse. Yeah, yeah. Because... I think the Magnificent Seven theme plays. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, um, definitely not the best Bond film, but a must watch for sure. Okay. Just going to remind you to tell somebody else about the show, you know, spread the word. If you want to write to us, it's GCA podcast. That's letter G, letter C, number eight podcast, all one word at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Eric. This is Johanna. Signing off. I never learned to read. <laughs>